there we go. And I'm going to see if I can launch the poll. Hang on just a second. And let's see if this first poll question will go through. Launch. Can you all see that? All right. We want to know who's here. Are you a CARES and a CPS? Are you a supervisor or a clinician? Are you a friend or an ally or are you other? And is, are y'all able to answer? Because I'm not getting any answers. I don't know if there's, all right. All right. Speaking now, I'm a bit, yes. Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's still not great. I can see the answers. Okay. Okay, good. All right. If you would take a picture of the answers for me, that would be good. And Tara, if you can keep an eye on people and admitting people, that would be good too. I'll do All right. So I am going to share the results. Are y'all seeing that? All right. Good. All right, so I'm gonna end that and uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So hang on just a second. And we will get going. Can you all see the PowerPoint? No? All right. I see the Zoom logo. Ah, that's OK. So let me stop and try one more time in just a second. There we go. Is that working? All right. Yep, 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 there it is. All right, everybody. Well, here we go. Um, so first of all, I want to remind you that there is a webinar tomorrow. If you still need CEUs, there's a webinar tomorrow. Uh, uh, not tomorrow, it's Thursday at 1130 for, with Jeff Breedlove. He's going to be talking about the um, advocacy stuff that we'll be doing at ARAD this year. It's a great webinar, and that's another one and a half CEUs that you can get for going forward. Um, I was going to say tomorrow. <laughs> it's Thursday. We're having a this week, which is great. Yes. Lots of opportunity. All right. So I really like the opportunity. I wanted to do this webinar, first of all, so that y'all could get an extra shot at getting some more CEUs, but also because I think this is such an important topic and it's kind of hard to cover. So I wanted to come up with a different way to talk about it. So this is a bit of an experiment on my part. I hope I hope you like it. I hope it works okay. And give me some feedback. Let me know what I've left out. Um, but one of the things that a lot of this is stuff that I had to learn when I moved to Birmingham uh, uh, to work as a peer support specialist at UAB Medical Center in 2019. And uh, I didn't know anything about the recovery community in Birmingham. And so I had to learn so much and I really only knew about the AA recovery community here in Atlanta. So I would have said that I didn't know a whole lot about many pathways. And yet when I finally did this and looked at it, I had more pathways than I thought. And once I learned all this stuff, I thought it was really great to be able to talk about. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. There we go. So what are my pathways? You know, uh, so I've looked at my timeline, uh, my story, you know, and I started out, I got my first DUI in 1992. That's when I was about 35 years old. Uh, so that was my first interaction with the legal system. And that would be my, my only interactions with the legal system, except for the occasional parking ticket are all the DUIs that I got. So uh, trying to get back and forth to the bar that I was going to, you know, all three of my DUIs were driving home from the same bar. Took a moment for me to figure that out, you know. Um, 
1995, the second DUI happened, and I was not interested in going to AA. I drove over to the parking lot of an AA meeting uh, and sat there for about five minutes and then drove off. And what I like to say is that my heart wanted help, but my head wouldn't quite fit through the door. Um, and so I ended up uh, going to the meditation center instead. And so I ended up meditating. I fell in love with meditation because it worked with my anxiety, just like alcohol did. And uh, I meditated a lot, but that was not about stopping drinking. So that was not helping with uh, uh, my substance misuse. Um, 2001, that's when the third DUI happened, and that's when DeKalb County made me go. Um, and that's when I fell in love with AA. It's pretty amazing that I had been avoiding this thing all these years that I really loved, that really was great for me as an anxious person and an isolator, to be able to go to a place where there would be people I could talk to and people who would listen to me. Um, so in 2005, I took refuge as a Buddhist, and that was my first situation where I actually took a, chose a faith that I wanted to follow. Um, and in that, the next year, uh, I started an a, a Buddhist-flavored AA meeting that's still going. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute as well. Uh, in 2011, I was still doing recovery. And then I became an active Buddhist teacher trainee. And that was a great thing. Uh, and then in 2018, I participated in CARES 28. Uh, that's when I got laid off from Barnes and Noble and I ended up changing my recovery, transforming it enormously when I had the chance to um, participate in the CARES Academy. And then I went to Birmingham to work as a chaplain and a caregiver at UAB Medical Center. And that's when I uh, got a chance to eventually become a peer support specialist over there. And that's when I started going to the Buddhist recovery program called Recovery Dharma. And so that is a really important part of my recovery as well. Then uh, finally, I returned to Atlanta uh, in 2022 to work for the Georgia Council. And uh, so employment for those last four years is what's been going on with my recovery employed in the recovery field. So when I look at my many pathways and look, distill them down to sort of, uh, you know, what I've been doing, my pathways are the legal system, um, Buddhism and meditation, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, bringing together Buddhism and recovery, working as a caregiver, and then also working as a peer. And so uh, having a chance to do all those, are sort of the pathway that I followed. And it was been it has been really important for my recovery to evolve. So I think one of the great things that we can do when we look at many pathways, we want many pathways for people coming into recovery, but as people who have been in recovery for a long time, many pathways are important for us as well because our recovery can grow and change if we are um, involved in looking at, at how we can what we can add to our recovery to make it work. Does that make sense? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so what do we mean when we say many pathways? And I was looking at this, you know, because I just, it was a good thing for me to think about. It's a good thing for me to talk about um, because we talk about this here at the Georgia Council a lot. And I wanted to make sure that I uh, had a better understanding of it and could could explain it. So as I started thinking about it, I said, so what is part of a recovery pathway? First of all, a recovery pathway is any, I, I, this is my definition, any support, any method of support for attaining uh, recovery from substance misuse. So, and that's a very broad definition because we have a very broad definition of many pathways here at the Georgia Council. And that went too fast. Uh, some of the characteristics that I see in a pathway is a network and a fellowship of people who might be using that same method to establish recovery or a common practice or an exercise that unites peers in their recovery process. But also the stuff that we do just to, when our lives change, when things change in our careers and our circumstances, the stuff that we do is individual to us. And it can be built around a fellowship, or it may be solitary, it may be part of our career. It's basically anything. I'm going to look at some of the more structured ones first, and then as we go on, I'll look at some of the ones that are less structured. 
But um, I think it's good for us to make sure we have a broad understanding of what pathways are um, so that we uh, support, in, support any pathway that any peer you might be working with uh, thinks would help in their recovery. Um, and like I said, our pathways change as our recovery grows and evolves. Uh, do you all have anything you want to say about this? Is there anything that you think uh, would be involved? Uh, what would be, what do you think is part of a recovery pathway? Hey, I'm Amy. Hey, Amy. Um, al alcoholic. I don't know if we're supposed to do that here, but um, I, for my recovery, personally, I have what I call a triangle of recovery. Okay. And I go to AA, I've uh, been sober for a little over 10 years, and, and um, I go to AA, I also have had a therapist for that amount of time, and I, I also take psychiatric, you know, for my bipolar and that type of thing, but I feel like without all three of those things, my recovery wouldn't uh, work, and mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't be have the serenity that I have. Um, with that combination of um, tools that I have. Awesome. And did it take you a while to pull all those together into one thing? I've been in therapy and on um, medication on and off throughout my life. And I, before I got sober for years, I would buy self-help books and try to find spiritual foundations and just all these things. And once I really realized that what the actual problem was is my drug and alcohol use, um, it got better. But then when I got sober, I realized that I was still depressed and I was still anxious because mm -hmm. I thought that, that would all go away, you know, but I was the realization that I was self-medicating and um, then I had to get the, you know, the correct diagnoses and the correct um, medications to help me with what I was actually um, dealing with. And then the um, therapy helps me get through with my trauma that I had mm -hmm. as a child and throughout my life. And um, my therapist really helps me through that. And then um, the AA, I have, a, I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. I have three sponsees. I go to meetings about three times a week um, on a perfect picture. And mm -hmm. um, without all three of those things, I just uh, feel like my recovery program would fall apart. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to talk about uh, what their many pathways look like just from this list right here? Is there something that I should add to this list about what a recovery pathway is? I like to think that uh, I'm Vanya. I like to think, um, thank you, uh, Amy. Um, so I have a pathway. I do the 12 step fellowship as well. Um, and uh, religion, church. I do attend church on a regular basis. Um, and now my career is not really like I use it because I know some people get caught up in that, like their job is their recovery because they work in recovery. But it absolutely, um, the many pathways since I've been in this, uh, in this genre, uh, what, about four years now going on, it has opened my eyes to the many pathways. Because I was strictly like, you know, hey, you do it this the way, you know, that works or whatever. So I'm real grateful that I've learned that in this uh, with um, going through cares and stuff. And so my job, it helps me to practice my recovery. You know, the principles, open mindedness, some humility, you know, things of that nature. And then there's, you know, the so my social life, things that, that enhance and keep me grounded. Um, as Amy was talking about. So yeah, it's a different pathways like social, social life, my, you know, um, you got, uh, you had uh, something on there I thought I saw. But at any rate, those three things definitely has um, added to my recovery. Um, recently being a job, as you said, pathways evolve and change. So absolutely. 
Thank you, Vanya. Oh, so go I'm sorry. One more person. Hey. Hi. Um, so my pathway started with the legal system as well. Mm -hmm. um, 12 step and all of that as well. I think what's really defined is with my peers finding different options for different thought processes. Like I have a few peers that are anti-religion, anti-higher power. So being open-minded to finding other pathways that I may not agree with and that would work for them, even though I don't agree with them, it's what would work best for them. Mm -hmm. One example is the sober faction. Does anyone else know what that is? What is that sober faction? Yeah, it's from the uh, Satanic Temple. Oh, my. Yes. And when you hear that, a lot of people are very, and like, that's not okay. But it's just a science-based sober meeting that happens online and has nothing to do with Satan. It's just <laughs> science-based uh, recovery without a higher power. Wow. Thank you. I've never heard of that. That's gotten on, that's going on my list. Yeah. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on to the next slide. We'll have some more opportunity to talk about this. There we go. There we go. So these were the pathways that I came up with when I was writing things down. I'm going to, there's a slide for each one of these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each slide because what I wanted was just to bring it up and mention them just as a reminder that these are out there because I suspect most of us know that they're out there, but it, we may not, you know, and I'll send you all the, this slide deck when we're done, uh, at, when you get your certificate, if you want to still have access to it. But um, so I talk about AA, I end up talking about AA a lot because it's such a huge part of pathways. I don't want you to think that it's the only pathway or even the main pathway. But because it's so big, it's worth talking about and thinking about. So there's AA and then the various flavors of AA. Um, there are the other anonymous fellowships that use the big book. Um, there is Narcotics Anonymous, which has its own uh, literature. Then there are family support meetings and trauma support meetings. Uh, there's Buddhist recovery, smart recovery, faith-based recovery, yoga and exercise, uh, treatment, counseling, Matt, Matt Marr um, and mental health medications, other virtual options, online communities, and employment in recovery. And that's basically what I got to when I stopped editing yesterday. So I know that there are more out there that we can add to this list that I think would, would be good to. But this is what we're going to talk about today. All right. Here we go. So um, I think of AA as the original pathway. Uh, it was uh, the, the original mutual support group with one alcoholic working with another. Uh, it works very much. It, it worked very much like peer support back in the day. And I think there's a real similarity there that it's almost like peer work is sort of the updating of what AA was doing back then, modernizing and professionalizing it, uh, taking it out of any individual context. But it basically was no authority, one person working with another person, dealing with the same issue, um, no, no rules, no fees, no anonymity. It took a while for it to evolve towards sponsorship, which is the only like authority figure. Um, but uh, I think it was successful because it was the, uh, of, of the support groups at the time, it was the one that was the least shame based. Um, because uh, the, the one person working with another who's dealing with the same issue was what made it effective. And um, I think it, it, it's amazing that it started back in 1935 and uh, has grown today. I think, I think a lot of what happens uh, in recovery nowadays is because AA figured a lot of it out a long time ago. We've updated a lot of things. Other things have come along. But 12 steps and how this works is pretty similar to a lot of the stuff we're doing. Um, there we go. All right, one of the reasons that AA was able to continue to help people and sort of help other programs start uh, is because of their traditions and their leadership. You know, the AA, the 12 traditions attempted to give a structure 
to meetings all over the country uh, who were all doing things differently. So what they did was say, well, you can do what you need to do over here and you can do, there are these few things we want us to try to stay together on, but basically it's autonomy for y'all to figure out what works best as long as it, it supports AA as well. Um, another thing, uh, the General Services Office in New York decided not to charge people with copyright infringement if they started using the 12 steps themselves for something other than AA, which is an amazingly generous thing to do. And I think that it made a huge difference in all of these other programs occurring, uh, including NA, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. Uh, and then clubhouses, since AA didn't want um, its meetings to own property, uh, there were these clubhouses and that meant that there were other, uh, there was space for other meetings to occur that were not AA because the clubhouses were not AA. So that's why you'll see a lot of other meetings other than just Alcoholics Anonymous at a clubhouse. So uh, it's very generous and it means that what they did is they put recovery at the center of what they were doing which I think is really, you know, very, you know, doing, knowing that recovery is the most important thing, um, but knowing that back in 1935 and continuing to carry that through to today has been their great achievement, I think. So my personal motto is that uh, my gratitude goes to AA because that's how I got sober, but my allegiance now is to recovery, no matter how it is established, because recovery is the most important thing. That's what we want to make sure that we're working to do. I so like I, that. I, I, I'm I, that. Can please, I steal that. <laughs> please do, Vanya. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and I think this is sort of the peer, the spirit of peer support as well. You know that you know we all have we all love the way that helped us get sober, but we all also know that recovery is ultimately the most important. Absolutely. All right. So if you are referring a peer to AA, here are the advantages that AA has. Meetings are everywhere. There's an enormous number of meetings. It's by far the largest place you'll be able to find recovery support. The size of the fellowship, who knows? You really can't measure it, but it's probably in the millions of people worldwide. And they are all doing the same thing. The commonality of the practice of using the 12 steps makes it very uh, easy for you to move to another place and continue with your recovery program. Uh, it's got a long history. I mean, many of the other 12-step uh, programs that we know about would not have people with 50 years of sobriety because they've not been around for 50 years. AA has a huge, long track record and a lot, huge number of people. Uh, they have the traditions that help create a structure. You have the freedom to start new meetings if you want to. And you have the autonomy to run the meeting in the way that you think is best for recovery. And that was really important for me. As I'm going to show on the next slide, there are all of these specialty versions of AA meetings, which I think are really amazing that they exist. Uh, some people say that these specialty meetings are not consistent with AA's traditions, but nobody can stop people from having them. And I think that's really great um, that it works that way. Uh, young people's meetings, you know, having people who are your age who are uh, doing this practice uh, is one way that brings you in, in a way that might not work if you were only dealing with people as old as I am, for instance. Um, so I think that that's a great thing. Um, women's meetings, you know, sometimes women need to have, women have trouble having their voice heard in an AA meeting where there are a lot of men. Uh, I know that when I was at the gay clubhouse, women would sometimes come over to our clubhouse for a meeting because they felt like they could come to that meeting and there was no sexual tension for them to deal with. Um, and so the fact that women's meetings is the, the same thing. The women's meetings are there uh, to take that component out, you know, uh, and uh, they, some women's meetings go to the, the point of, of excluding men. Uh, and some people would say that's not consistent with the AA traditions, but a meeting can do whatever it wants to, to think uh, that, that it wants to support recovery. Um, and these meetings are not always published or advertised. Sometimes you have to find out about them by word of mouth. Um, and it's uh, good to be piped into a network so that you can uh, find out about 
meetings that might be useful for your peers that wouldn't be easy to find. Um, another one, there, there's, there are stag meetings. Uh, and uh, I have never been, I tend not to, I, I go to gay meetings because, I, uh, because I'm gay. <laughs> and uh, it was really important for me to find a place where I could get that kind of support. Um, so I understand uh, stag meetings are places where men can go and they can talk uh, about things that are going on with more, perhaps more freely than they would if women were around. Sometimes men might not be willing to say some things if women are in the room. Sometimes women feel like they can't be heard if men are in the room. So the, having these options is real important. Uh, the LGBTQ meetings that I know of usually are open to anyone, but they want you to know that gay people will be there because some people are uncomfortable with gay people. And so it's a great opportunity for people just to find out, you know, and, and I, I have, uh, I spent a lot of time um, at Galano, which is the gay clubhouse here in Atlanta. And it's amazing to have an entire clubhouse full of meetings uh, that are for people who have a higher tendency toward addiction than the norm, than the regular population. So I think that that's really good. Um, any questions about this? How many of y'all attend a meeting like this? I do. Uh, which kind? Do. Women's um, meeting? Yeah, and um, LGBTQT. Okay. Doreen, <laughs> Doreen, your hands up. Oh, yes. I was going to say that I attend women's meetings, is a big part of my recovery. I'm Doreen. Hello, everybody. Um, and I also go to a faith-based meeting specific to Islam where we can, because in most of the other 12-step meetings, you can't, well, it is suggested that you don't speak on your specific faith or the name of your higher power. So I go to a specific Islamic meeting where I can share about that freely. Uh, is that meeting, Doreen, is that in the directory that people can find it or is it a word of mouth kind of thing? It's a word. Of, it's definitely word of mouth. But yes, they have a website and, you know, a lot of Zoom meetings and they have face to face meetings. I heard about it from Philly and um, on a, in Atlanta. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to. And and so this is the kind of thing that you only find out about when you start letting people tell their stories. So I'm, that's why I'm really glad to to be able to do this. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. And this is another one that I've used. Agnostic and atheist meetings. Uh, there is at Galano. Uh, there is on Wednesday nights, uh, Tuesday, uh, excuse me, Tuesday nights at 730 a meeting called We Agnostics, which I started attending in 2014. And it was an amazing uh, change to my recovery to see what a meeting looked like that where they did not pray. Uh, and I was able to find a lot of support there uh, as someone who identifies as Buddhist, but isn't angry about any other religion that I've participated in as I was growing up. And um, we agnostics was uh, in, in many ways that meeting didn't look any different from any other meeting, except the people shared the same way. They just usually didn't refer to God when they were sharing. And uh, I found it to be interesting to look at. Uh, there's also a group called Free Thinkers. Uh, and I don't I don't know if there are any of those in Atlanta. Uh, I have they have a website. And if you want to go and check on websites for things like this, that's a great, a great place. You can just search for free, free thinkers or we agnostics and things like that and other meetings might come up. Uh, but these are important for people early in recovery who might be having issues with higher power. And we wanna make sure that, uh, one of the things my sponsor told me early in recovery is that the only thing you have to know to start your recovery is that you are not God. And you can start from there. And and did someone unmute? I thought someone might have wanted to say something. Anyway, uh, that you can that uh, you are not God and you can go from there. I've seen people who have transitioned from being very strong atheists to being uh, believers. I've seen them remain very strong atheists and stay sober. Um, so um, these kinds of meetings, I have a friend who would always who uh, identified as an atheist and would always speak up 
uh, when a newcomer was in the room just to make sure that that voice was heard while other people uh, were talking about what they were talking. So I think uh, he was uh, he was that's part of his service was to make sure that he was able to support people early in recovery who might think that the, that uh, some of the higher power stuff in AA excluded. Them. And I will tell you Sorry. that. Go ahead. Vanya, is that Vanya? No, go. Yeah, I, I was just curious with that down here is so it said they wanted to make sure we weren't reading an altered version of the 12 steps so were they or were they not did they follow they were not they did not read the 12 okay. steps at all <laughs> okay okay that, that works too because yeah that okay. was their way well, around it and you know yeah I mean, a good way <laughs> they read they read uh, passages from more about alcoholism and there is a solution um, so yes, and uh, that is uh, that meeting is still going on. If anyone needs to to try to try find something like that, all right. Then there are the twelve step fellowships that use the big book, but are but have different names. Uh, and um, there is Heroin Anonymous, which uh, I is an incredibly strong fellowship in Birmingham. Uh, because uh, I think because AA was so conservative that um, the people who had used opioids needed a place where they could talk more freely. And uh, that's a really strong, it's a very tight fellowship. They use the big book uh, and change the words as they need. And they um, um, ask that only heroin or opioid users share in those meetings. Uh, at least the ones that I was able to watch. I was uh, working on the detox unit and that meeting was on Zoom and I was able to Zoom into it. And it was amazing to be able to participate in. Uh, uh, is there Heroin Anonymous that y'all know of outside of Atlanta? We have it in Augusta here. Awesome. And it's a really good meeting. We have uh, CA and CMA here as well. Yeah, that's great. Are those how often a week? Well, um, CMA and HA meet once a week and then CA meets twice a week. OK. Yeah. So that's some good support, you know? Yeah, really good meetings. Good yeah. alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that when I was in Birmingham, there were some issues about whether people who were using Matt Mars support for their recovery um, could uh, could be sponsored. Some people were not willing to sponsor people on Suboxone, for instance. Um, and I know that that's an evolving uh, issue, uh, but it would be one way for um, you know, one thing for you to be able to find whether the right kind of support is available for the person that you're sending. Um, cocaine Anonymous. So my understanding of Cocaine Anonymous is that it is not very well named. <laughs> that uh, you can talk about any particular drug that you used at that meeting. They really don't care. And, no, sure don't. and that you can talk about anything that you want to talk about there. Uh, and it was that was also a really strong fellowship in Birmingham. Uh, I uh, know many people who combined uh, that with either AA or Recovery Dharma or Heroin Anonymous for their recovery. And they had a really strong recovery. And so um, Cocaine Anonymous. Uh, Bonnie, I'm going to get through this list and then I'll ask your question. Is that OK? Yes. Uh, so Crystal Meth Anonymous, that may be primarily or majority uh, gay male fel uh, um, fellowship because of the way that drug and sex are related. Uh, and um, I was uh, I remember attending uh, meetings at the Galano Clubhouse when there would be maybe 10 people in the big room. Uh, this was in the early aughts, uh, the early teens, like 2011. There would be uh, maybe 10 people in the main room and 50 people spilling out in the hallway from one of the smaller rooms at the, the CMA meeting. So uh, it's, it's really big in Atlanta. It wasn't as big as Birmingham because I think the gay po population in Birmingham is not as large. And then this new fellowship called Drug Addicts Anonymous, which is out of Sweden, and it may be that it is like Cocaine Anonymous, only it is properly named. That it, <laughs> that it is uh, available for any particular drug. 
Uh, but I believe that it's a really, you know, it is, it's one that's strong in Birmingham. I'd never heard of it anywhere else before. Uh, but there are all these fellowships that we, uh, you know, there's um, Marijuana Anonymous. My colleague Tara mentioned that to me today. Uh, there's Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, and many, many, many more. So the other 12-step programs, I think most of those do use the big book and change the words. Um, but keep an eye out for those to be able to support your peers as well. Uh, Vanya? Yeah, I just want to go to the Cocaine Anonymous. Um, that came out during the crack epidemic, um, actually, in Florida, in Daytona, where I'm from. Um, um, my former sponsor came from Kansas City, and we were talking about clubhouses, and actually started a CA meeting in the AA clubhouse, and they were very rebellion at first. Mm -hmm. Everyone did, yeah. But um, I spent nine years of my recovery there, but only because that was the epidemic, crack epidemic. So Cocaine Anonymous, you know, was real prep, uh, uh, came about during the crack epidemic yeah. in Florida. They taught where I'm from. And um, so that was my home group for nine years before I moved here to um, Georgia in 2008. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it says cocaine and all other move my altering substances. Mm -hmm. in the yes. So yeah, I could talk about anything, absolutely. But uh, yeah, so I, I had nine years of recovery in CA. Thank and you, that Vanya. Was the crack epidemic. Yeah, that's the crack epidemic. And Reggie, Reginald, excuse me. Yes, I want to just share real quickly about the Crystal Meth Anonymous. Um, every other week, I help co-facilitate uh, a Crystal Meth recovery uh, group for gay men over on the west side of Atlanta with my co-worker. And initially, it was just me tagging along because I was told that I need to start facilitating groups, whatever they were. And I got to tell you, when I the first time I went, I didn't have any apprehensions because my perspective on recovery everybody's included i don't care mm -hmm. where you come from what your background your genre is you know who you like who you don't like i don't care i've never had judged anybody but i actually fell in love with that meeting because even though i wasn't recovering from crystal meth my my drug of choice was crack the 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 uh the transparency mm -hmm. and the uh the honesty with everybody there it was just phenomenal and it was, i just made an immediate connection and uh uh, I've been doing it uh, for like the last, gosh, year, nine, 10, 11 months, maybe a year. And I, I love it every time I go there because we have the guys there. We have a genuine, sincere, heartfelt connection because I also felt alienated from the regular NA meetings because I would always speak my mind about some of the stuff that I would see some of the old timers do who would do all the good sharing. But <laughs> After the meeting and outside the meeting, they were living the most grimy lives. Some of the newcomer women would come up to me when I was in initially in recovery, when I was a newcomer, and they would share their experience with some of the old timers about how they were being a, a preyed upon, how they were being approached to trick off with the old timers. And it just, anyway, I just felt a better connection at this meeting mm -hmm. with all the, the, the guys at the Crystal Meth meeting. Thank you, Reginald. Um, one more, Denise, I'll, uh, and then we're going to move on. I want to make sure we get to all the slides always. Okay. Um, there's another 12-step group called Double Trouble in Recovery. Thank you. And yes, yeah, and it's that. for people who um, have the substance use as well as a mental health diagnosis or any um, issues with mental health. So that is one of the programs that... Um, I attend, um, it, it is where I work. I um, facilitate it once a week, but through Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, it is, you can find it online every mm -hmm. day. Thank you. And is it a, tw does it use the big book? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you for reminding me that, that sh I should have had that in my uh, handout. Yeah. It, should, it would be lower in the meet and because I talked yeah. about mental health a little <laughs> further down. Okay. Uh, Ashley actually mentioned it uh, too. Ashley mentioned it. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, let me keep moving. Uh, thank you all. This is great. This is exactly what I was hoping it would be like. So there are family and trauma meetings. You know, uh, there are some people, I've heard many people talk about how they went to the Al-Anon meeting and then realized they were in the wrong room and went down the hall to the AA meeting or the 12-step meeting. 
so Al-Anon and CODA, Codependence Anonymous, those are both the anonymous programs that are family programs. And then the non-anonymous programs, uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics, which is very trauma-informed, and CRAFT. And if some of you may remember, we did uh, CARES Connect about CRAFT back in 2022, which is a more peer support uh, type of family meeting rather than a 12-step meeting. Uh, and I know that there were some people who, because of that training, decided to become certified to be to lead craft meetings. And I think there may be some in Georgia. I'm not sure where. But keep an eye out for that if you're looking for family meetings, if you have uh, uh, if you have people who you think might benefit from that. All right, let me move over and see if they can get this to work. There we go. Well, our recovery meetings fall under that, um, Alvin? They're coming. <laughs> I've got them on here oh, for the band. Oh, okay. Uh, so NA, okay, meetings. Gotcha. NA meetings are up next because NA is the first program that wrote its own literature separate from Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, it was founded in 1953, and as early as 1944, Bill Wilson was discussing the possibility of addicts creating a separate program for mutual support. It was the first 12-step fellowship uh, after AA and was the first to write its own literature. Uh, and it is more modern and updated in its language than the big book. Some people really like that. And I know a lot of people who also like their meditation book and some people who like their workbook. Um, in Birmingham, NA was a strong fellowship for African-Americans. And uh, one of my jobs was to ask people to tell their story uh, at our IOP group every week. And once I got one per one African American woman who had 30 years to tell her story, she referred 15 people to me with 20, 30, 40 years of recovery uh, in Birmingham, NA. And it was it's incredibly strong fellowship. I assume that that had something to do with the crack epidemic as well. And also the go into the place where you feel the most comfortable. You know, um, if you're there amongst people who have done much of what you have done, then my, that might be the best place for you to be. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, Tara, do the are the let's see if we can get one of those polls working. The one about 12 step. Is that I can't see it. Is it coming up? May not. I may not be able to see it because I'm the host. Let me see. I might be able to do this up here. I saw it the first time. Did nobody else see it the first time? It came up, right? I yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, you did? Oh, there it is. Let me try this. Here we go. Let's see if this one will launch. Can you all see that? Yes. All right. Uh, so this was my question. I have used 12-step recovery. 12-step uh, recovery is my main pathway. I have not used 12-step recovery. So if you all want to answer that question. And y'all y'all can see it. Yep. I answered already. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I can't share the results. Can you, Tara? Yeah, you can't see them there. I, I can't see the results. I can just see the poll before without anybody answering it. Mm -hmm. I just saw the results. They just went away. Ah, yeah. how many? How many people said what? <laughs> okay, so I can see where the people in my office got to hear me. Um, it is um seventy percent of the people have used twelve steps in recovery as their pathway. Thirty five percent um people have twelve steps as their main pathway, and ten percent have not used twelve steps of recovery. Awesome, thank you. I, I am very curious about the results in some of these polls, so I appreciate that. 
So y'all can still see the slides. Mm -hmm. All right. So faith-based recovery, celebrate recovery is uh, the one that everybody knows about. Um, and from their website, uh, Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered 12-step recovery program for anyone struggling with hurts, hang-ups, and habits. That's the phrase I hear from everybody in, in Celebrate Recovery of any kind. Uh, started in Saddleback Church in California, and it didn't initially start using the 12 steps. It used the eight principles that were based on the Beatitudes, what, it, what I was familiar with, uh, though now everywhere I think they use the 12 steps. They're in many places in the Celebrate Recovery as well. Um, and it, I noticed on the website that when they printed the 12 steps, they removed the words as we understood him from the, the 12 steps which was interesting, I thought, uh, because there was the, the, that, that some people see that as a loophole for atheists and agnostics. And I don't know if that is, is how that works or not, but that wasn't on the steps that I looked at on the Celebrate Recovery website. And my experience with Celebrate is it can be harder to find because not all meetings are necessarily listed on the national website. Uh, and, and I tell people just to talk to the nearby church if they are uh, wanting to find a Celebrate Recovery meeting. How many of y'all are Celebrate, are faith-based? Who's a Celebrate Recovery person in here? I've gone to Celebrate Recovery quite a few times. Um, I, like I, get, I get something out of it. Um, yeah, I enjoy it. Cool. Um, another aspect of faith-based recovery is that some churches have their own recovery ministries or their own uh, recovery programs. Um, I know that here in Atlanta, North Atlanta Church of Christ has an off-the-chain 12-step spiritual support group. They have recovery Bible studies and mentorships. Uh, Tara mentioned a group called the Overcomers to me earlier today. Um, so, um, so it's interesting to me, uh, you know, that's such an important uh, pathway for spirituality. And I'm really glad that churches are because um, early in recovery, people felt like they were getting uh, judged by uh, religious people. I mean, that's the reason uh, the as we understood him was in the 12 steps. And I'm really glad to see that we are getting to. Uh, uh, more um, supportive and inclusive help for uh, for us. I know that there's we always a, ways to improve. Got, at, at my church, we have a Reformers Unanimous. That's their recovery. Reformers Unanimous. Yes, sir. Okay. I never I never been to it. I go to CMA, but they they do have it. They do offer it there. Okay. Who else? What other kind of programs are there in your local area? For people looking for faith-based recovery, um, I live in Carrollton, and there's a, a CR meeting here on Friday mm -hmm. nights. I'm not sure where, but I okay. think it starts at like seven o'clock. Okay. So I am going to. There's a poll for this one. Let me see if I can launch it. There we go. Can y'all see that? Not yet. Nope. Thank you for uh, putting up with our technical issues today. Tonight, I appreciate it. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Okay, good. All right, all right. Can y'all look see the results? That's not okay. what me. 
So uh, the first one was I used faith faith based recovery in that twenty nine percent. I do not have faith based in other recovery fellowships is thirty three percent, and I do not use faith based recovery is forty eight percent. All right, that's just about one third for each question. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Let me get out of that. Going to keep moving here to make sure we can get through everything. So 12-step uh, yoga meetings and 11-step meetings. Um, I ended up going to a yoga meeting uh, in like 2015. For two and a half years, it became my very favorite meeting because I could have told you that I never did yoga that I am not the person who should be doing yoga. I didn't have the body for it. And uh, a friend of mine was the teacher and I was willing to try it and it transformed my recovery. It was really great. Uh, so that was this one down here where it says Kashi Urban Ashram uh, and they are uh, in uh, Candler Park. If you're looking for a meeting, I think it's on Monday nights at 7.30. There's also Y12SR. And you can find those meetings online. I know there's one at Jeff's place uh, on the intersection of Ponce and Ponce Place. Um, and each of these meetings has a sharing circle and an intentional yoga class taught by a certified Y12SR instructor. And there's two meetings in Atlanta, one in Marietta, one in Macon, one in Dublin, one in Savannah. So that's a great a large amount of support for people who are looking for that kind of support. Have any of y'all done uh, recovery yoga? I want to do it. Ashley I nodding. Do it. I do it. All right. Reggie says, Reginald says he's going to do it. Yeah, we had that at Navigate Recovery um, before COVID. Yeah. We had it at Navigate Recovery, yeah, before COVID. Yeah. Brittany? <clears throat> I was just going to say, I know we had it when I was in treatment. Um, there was a yoga studio close by to there that had Y12SR. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they still do, but they did for a, long, yeah, for yeah. a few years. Yeah. Yeah. And Doreen? Hi. Yes. Um, I've done Y2, Y12 yoga. It's right off of here, off of Is off it Vista, Vista Road. Road. I think it's yeah. Vista Yoga. Vista oh, yoga, not. yes. Mm -hmm. um, we when we moved over here, we were doing that, and actually during the pandemic, they had converted online where you could do it on Zoom and still participate in it. The instructors, so yeah. that was very big part of my recovery. Yeah, um, I meant I put the Buddhist twelve the Buddhist twelve step meeting that I started in Atlanta in this category as well. Because this is a meeting that incorporates 10 minutes of meditation into the beginning of the meeting. And those are great. And there's a long history in AA of what they call 11 step meetings, where you have some quiet time at the beginning. You know, it can be as little as five minutes. It can be completely unstructured or it can be, you know, full meditation. But boy, it changes the way the whole meeting feels. It really is amazing the way it can transform what's going on. And we had people drive from two or three hours away when they wanted to see what this crazy 12-step Buddhist meeting looked like in, in Decatur. And I was very grateful that uh, it, it, it transformed my recovery. All right, there are actual Buddhist meetings. And let me, I'll, I'll come to Reggie and Alexis in just a minute. Uh, the, I don't know if any of you know about Refuge Recovery. Uh, refuge Recovery is a uh, program that was started in 2011 by Noah Levine uh, that uses the some of the aspects of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path instead of the 12 steps and would begin with 15 minutes of guided meditation. Um, refuge recovery was popular, but then there was a scandal related to him and uh, a lot of the meetings broke off to start Recovery Dharma where they wrote their own literature. Uh -huh. And where they uh, do the same thing, basically, but it is it is peer led instead of having a leader or a founder. And this became a really important part of my recovery. It is uh, really awesome. I, I am very appreciative of it. Um, Alexis, your hand is up. Um, 
<clears throat> about the the meditation when I went it really like when I say it transformed my being <laughs> like it wouldn't I wouldn't be here I don't meditate like I should it's been on my heart though like I really <laughs> I, I have to again because it totally like took me it it set my day so to hear that there's an actual meeting that that includes that is like insane um <laughs> like i don't i can't even imagine um what that would even be like and and then the power in the room mm -hmm. that you would feel you know i just can't imagine so thank you reginald okay my question is this alvin and to every anyone and everybody else that might can give me some input so I've always heard and been told, um, especially when I was uh, new in recovery, that meditation is a strong and major part of the recovery process. My situation has always been from the beginning after I got off the crack, uh, because of my 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 life experiences, domestic domestically violent environment growing up as a child, I uh, flashbacks, using dreams still going on 12 years later. How I've never been able to like really latch on to meditation, and how do you cross that threshold where you're actually benefiting from being still, being silent? And how do you tap into meditation without your mind being all over the place? I can mm -hmm. never turn my brain off. Yeah, uh, Alexis, did you want to answer that? Yes. Okay. So I have the same issue, and I have the same issue um, <laughs> now. So you would think I would know better, you know, but that's the, that's us. We don't. We know better. We don't. We don't want to do it anyway. Um. Uh. Well. <laughs> so the one of the the best um. Um. Uh, uh. Guided meditations in the the beginning that they when they were teaching us was that it's okay. Like, not to judge, just whatever comes through your brain. Don't judge it. Just let it come. Let it go. Let it come. Let it go. And just keep breathing. And in one of the guided meditations, it was like, think about it as like, if you get off of the train, like if your mind starts to ramble, it's okay. Just get back on the train. And when you're breathing, like they're talking about breathing, you're actually, if you, if you um, breathe in, for like it, the worksheet said eight, breathe in for eight counts and out for 16, in through your nose and out through your mouth. But the point is, is double it. So double out whatever you're bringing in through your nose. You're activating your polyvagal nerve that's behind your ear. Behind your, uh, Thank yeah, you, sorry. Alexis. Thank you, Ashley. You had your hand up as well. So I completely understand that. Um, I like guided meditations that have a lot of cussing in them. <laughs> like it, it, it makes me laugh. It releases endorphins and dopamine. Um, guided meditations on YouTube. They're called honest meditations. My peers absolutely love them. And you, they're like, my favorite one is like two and a half minutes. And it's called F that an honest, mod an honest meditation. And I swear I've used it in so many different situations. And after that two and a half minutes, I feel so much better. <laughs> I'm going to check that out. Thank you for that, it's that recommendation. <laughs> yeah, my experience is if people think they're doing right, they're not doing it right when their mind feels very cloudy when they start. But your mind is going to feel very cloudy when you start because you haven't been meditating. And um, from my experience is that if I stick with it, it does get better. But uh, you have to know that sitting through it when it feels cloudy is part of the point, you know. But uh, yeah, we can I, I can talk with you about it later, uh, Reginald, if you'd like. OK, thank you. All right. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Uh, smart recovery. How many of you all have heard of smart recovery? Before? Smart recovery is psychology based. Uh, it is an evidence based group. All the facilitators exercises in the facilitator's guidebook are documented and footnoted uh, to tell you why they think it's useful and helpful. Uh, and the facilitators are all trained. And the process is to go around to discern a topic from the people who are there and then use one of the exercises they know that relates to that. So it's a very, it's not somebody who can just come in and pick up the book, usually. 
Um, I, I looked and found about a dozen meetings in Metro Atlanta, and that's more than when I left town. So this is like a growing fellowship. But again, that, this can be, uh, I think, for me, this was a great thing to add on to somebody's recovery. There may not be enough meetings for it to be the only meeting that you do, but and uh, but it's a great, you know, I think it's great. It certainly helped me. Anybody with smart recovery experience? I will just keep going on because I do want to make sure that we keep going. All recovery meetings. So anybody who is a CARES experienced an all recovery meeting at your CARES training. And the idea behind that is that it is a non-denominational meeting, that anyone is welcome. It doesn't matter what, uh, regardless of who you are, of, your, of which drug you used, of your faith, of your race, of your time in recovery, et cetera. Everyone is welcome. And it's interesting that that can sound so radical um, when we think about uh, the fellowships that we attend, which are, you know, sort of focused on one person, one type of person, one type of drug, one type of experience. Um, I really loved when we did some all recovery meetings after my CARES Academy, that it was just a great mixture of people, you know, and it, 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 and it was very solution based because um, people were not so much focused on the problems they had with their particular drugs. Um, they often begin with the question, what's right with you? Uh, there are many different ways to run it. Uh, there is information about it on the faces and voices of recovery site. It's a great thing for you to have it in RCO or a treatment facility with many people in many different kinds of people in. And you know that the Georgia Council has two all recovery meetings on Zoom every day from 10 a.m. 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. And if you get our emails, you'll get the email for that link every Friday. Uh, and how many of y'all attend all recovery meetings in your local uh, places? Uh, Ashley, you have an in-person meeting that you can go to? Yes, Navigate Recovery, where I work, we hold an in-person and it's a hybrid. So mm -hmm. in-person and um, online, all recovery meeting every Thursday night at 730. Okay, awesome. All right. So after all recovery meeting, virtual recovery meetings. I like to put this out here just to remind people that now you can go anywhere for a meeting. You know, it is amazing the way the pandemic has transformed recovery. It was destructive to some of the meetings that I used to go to uh, before I left uh, for Birmingham because there are a lot of them are not there anymore. Some of them are very different. They're not the same. Some meetings adapted well, some didn't. You know, I always said that if you always went to a noon meeting, but you found a virtual meeting at four o'clock that you like, then you, you're not going to any other noon meeting. But your uh, patterns of recovery have changed. So um, it was an opportunity for all of the meetings to figure out how they wanted to evolve in this new world that we got thrust into. Uh, yeah. Virtual meetings are great for people with medical or legal or driving issues. Or disabled. Uh, they disabled, thank you. Uh, for people who find their local fellowships may be discriminatory or gossipy or generally not supportive. Um, I talked to a lot of people who, because they had a history of, of returning to use, that their meeting didn't take them very seriously when I was at UAB. And, you know, I just, we were able to successfully use Zoom for them to find people, a new group of people that they were able to thrive with. Uh, for people who don't live near meetings, for people who don't, uh, who are looking for a specialty kind of meeting, like I talked about earlier, for people with social anxiety, for people who need anonymity who can't be in person. For the first time now, recovery can be truly anonymous. No one can see you walk into a building. No one will be, no one, that you don't have to show your face so you know you will not see anybody who knows you, even if there is somebody in there who knows you. It's really interesting the way that our recoveries have changed and evolved because of the option of virtual meetings. Um, and it opens it up for so many people to be able to find different kinds of recovery. How many of y'all do regular virtual meetings now? Doreen? I do. Yeah, I definitely do. Vanya? Alexis? Yeah. Yeah, I have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you can go all over the world. Africa, Australia, 
You know, I know people that got clean on the screen, never had been in an in-person meeting, and they're celebrating almost three years now. Yeah. I never heard that before. Clean on the screen. Yeah. 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 Still clean. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, you told them I'm proud of them. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people could have pulled that off. We were doing our IOP classes on Zoom at the hospital. And we have people who got sober uh, doing IOP on Zoom, which was, you know, amazing, you know. All right. So another pathway, treatment and counseling. You know, this is stepping into more clinical areas. But many people will tell you that part of their pathway started with uh, inpatient treatment or uh, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, I did. Uh, I like to make sure this gets mentioned because, uh, you know, it's a whole process. Uh, it starts with medical detox where you are behind a locked door mm -hmm. and then stepping down to 26 day inpatient treatment, which is a slightly lower level of containment. Stepping down further to transitional housing and IOP, which is even less containment as you feel like you are more able to deal with your cravings and your urges to go use, you get more freedom back. That's the idea behind it. Meanwhile, they're strengthening the part of your, you that doesn't want to use with clinical, with counseling, with things like EMDR, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy, working with a counselor, working in small groups, individual counseling. You know, all of these things work, I think, for a certain number of people, maybe for people who are ready for that kind of support. Like any of this, I wasn't ready for AA until I was ready for it. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and um, a lot of people, the you know, the, uh, a lot of this is limited by insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, if this is something that's available to you, I didn't get any of this when I came in. <laughs> I am uh, getting sober 20 years ago. I needed AA because it was basically the only game in town back then. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's because of y'all that's available today. It's because of us. Oh. So that there are so many yeah. more. Right. Yeah. Really great. Yeah. All right. So thank you. Uh, treatment is, uh, treatment is my, my, I got, I went to treatment 29 years, five months and 12 days ago. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, look, huh. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, if I enjoy a joke after class. <laughs> you know, these corny jokes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so medication, uh, uh, medications of opioid use disorder, MOUD, which is also called MATMR support. Uh, these drugs are Suboxone, Subutex, Sublocade, Methadone, Vivitrol, Ooh. things that help with cravings and give people uh, the opportunity to not use. Uh, I, I can tell you just my, my love of this comes from uh, meeting with people on the detox unit. Uh, the day they came in, and then meeting with them 48 hours after they had started their Suboxone, and they were different people. It was astonishing. And we had a reasonable number of people who came back in uh, to the detox unit because they stopped their um, medicine-assisted therapy too soon. Uh, sometimes they had to because you cannot go to various uh, uh, treatment places if you're on some of these drugs. And I think that it's great that that's changing you know yes. you know yeah coming off suboxone is terrible i did it with both suboxone and yeah methadone. ashley so viewpoint health here in gwinnett now has a medication assisted recovery they have suboxone uh subutex and vivitrol mm -hmm. and you can't have insurance to use them because they're a community service board Mm -hmm. For those peers that are indigent or have no insurance, it's low to no cost, and they just walk in, they fill out the application, and they can get their medication dosed to them there. That's awesome. The drug that I am the most fascinated with is Sublicade, which is the monthly injection version of Suboxone. Um, and it takes away all of the ways that we might want to manipulate it. Uh, we can't sell it. We can't trade it. We can't skip it. It's a monthly injection and we can't forget it. You know, 
I think it's a great uh, it's a great innovation. And I have a friend who was working at a faith based treatment facility. He was oh. one of the peers with me at the hospital, and his goal was to have his faith based treatment facility support people on sublocate because they wouldn't need a doctor on staff. They would not need a safe to put the medications in and uh, that they would be able, even in a faith-based facility, and often faith-based facilities don't support uh, some of these MATMAR supports. But his goal was to make that possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of him. He's a great guy. But yes, these are all part of harm reduction and harm reduction is a path. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm, the next, on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about dry January which is a bit of harm reduction, if you think about it. Let's see if I can go for a month without drinking. If the only thing you've done is go for a month without drinking, then you have you may have changed your life. Um, you know, um, there are all of these things that are, these are all new movements. I can't tell you uh, very much about them because they're new. I think Life Ring, one of these is a, is a uh, subscription-based, community you pay so much a month and you can be a part of it and be a part of an intentional recovery community some of you may know russell brand who has been having some bad publicity lately but he is thinking he is something of a recovery guru he's an actor uh, that uh, you might know and a lot of people were following him he's got several books out there uh, this naked mind is by a woman named annie grace and she has i think a free app that you can use uh, that supports recovery. I found the Soberistas in Great Britain. Uh, there's a book out there called Sober-ish, you know, hmm. which is uh, uh, something that I've heard a lot of young people talking about. Part of this, I think, movement is by young people who are see the problems that alcohol is causing, might not feel the need for a program to stop, but do need some sort of community or some sort of connection. So I think this is great because it's... Was some, were you saying I'm sorry. Alexis? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. But these are all great, and there's many more out these. You can find tons of things like this out there. But these could be very helpful. Um, employment as a pathway to rec to sustain recovery. I didn't realize that I had been using that for the last five years. Especially since here at the Georgia Council, we talk a lot about how people, how uh, from a wellness standpoint. Your job is not your recovery. But from a recovery standpoint, your employment can be something that pulls you toward recovery and helps you maintain your path. But I think most people realize that they can't only do their job for recovery. But I think employment is a pathway uh, that I use along with the other pathways. Does that make sense? My employment helps save yes, me. Sir. Yes, sir. That makes sense. Reginald? Mm -hmm. My employment helped save me, especially because after I had got alienated and became a pariah at the local NAAA meetings in my neighborhood because <laughs> I was so brutally honest and outspoken, calling people out on their <laughs> BS. So, yeah, my, my employment was definitely a, a lifeline in, me, in my initial stages of years of recovery. Awesome. Yeah, my employment helps keep me accountable. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not the only thing I can do for my recovery, but it is a reminder every day of what I'm doing, you know. But there's other ways that employment can support your recovery as well. You can return to your previous career and try to rebuild that. You can go back to school. Uh, we I see a lot school. of people in the, who apply for CARES Academy. One of the things they put on their application is that they've gone back to school and some of them to be a counselor, some of them to be something else. Um, you know, so uh, it, it's interesting that they are applying, they are studying to be a counselor and applying as a peer, because we know those are very different things. <laughs> Reginald, your hands up. You know, it's funny when you do, when you do get encouraged by your employer to go back to school, they always automatically want to push you to be to lean towards um, a, 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 a counselor certification or, or degree. And I don't know, it's just not, it, it doesn't fit for everybody. And then when I initially started going to school to get my bachelor's in social work, I said, you know what? It's cool, but it, and it's, it's, it was engaging and uh, uh, um, uplifting and um, 
what can I say, um, motivating. But mm -hmm. I also realized that soon, eventually, um, I, I didn't want to have to end up going to a job every single day where I had to uh, uh, shoulder everybody's problems. And the majority of the time when I would get off, I would have people calling and texting me mm -hmm. to confide in me about my, my, my perception or opinion about what they had, what they were struggling with. And so I, I segued from go, uh, pursuing a degree in social work and uh, uh, counseling. And I, I moved on and, and now I'm in school for business administration at um, Kennesaw State. Cool. Cool. Anybody else want to say anything about um, employment as a pathway? I think um, for me, I can get laxed and go into my other meetings and stuff because I work in recovery. You know, it's that that thing. Mm -hmm. Just over the years, I've got like cut back on meetings. But really, my my work does help me meet all those needs that mm -hmm. the the uh, the groups that I go to meet as well like i've got the unity service and recovery you know what i mean i work with a peer force you know people mm -hmm. that understand me and know me very well hold me accountable <clears throat> and then i get to work with newcomers and you know it's it works i i still go to meetings but not as much and yeah i mean those are both pathways of mine i think it's interesting you have that listed on here that was the last one that I added because uh, when I did my own recovery list, that was what I felt like uh, I needed to talk about because that yeah. was that was my understanding. All right. Uh, so. Fortunately, my the owner of my company and my boss is also in recovery, and he tells me if I don't have my self care, I'm no good to him. So mm -hmm. make sure I make my meetings and you know take care of me. That's a good boss. Yeah, he is a good boss. All right, so those are my slides, everybody. 40, 40 messages. Look at that. Y'all have really been, I haven't been able to see the chat, so that's been going good. That's awesome. Um, so what do y'all want to talk about? We have about five more minutes. Anyone want to talk about some aspect of their many pathways that they just realized or they're familiar, uh, want to have any any feedback or anything? Shay. Um, Shay and I are together. I'm Cindy, <laughs> and I'm the art director at the Neverlong Clubhouse in Douglasville, RCO. And for me, part of my pathway is art. Um, and I think creative expression is a pathway, be it dance, um, music. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of our, our peers love music. We have, have a piano in our RCO also, and we have peers that just come in and even writing music, writing songs. Um, so I, it's a big part of my path. I started art journaling. I started out coloring, but then began to art journal and got into mixed media. And it was a form of getting out of my head, mm -hmm. me, getting my feelings out through that creative expression. So I do think that's a, a pathway you could include. Thank you for saying that. It'll be in the next version of this. Alexis? Um, well, so uh, the first thing that came to my head was um, how not ha not being employed is is harmful to my pathway to recovery mm -hmm. at the moment, which is why I have chosen now is the time to do this and go back to school and do this stuff because um you know it's really uh you know you don't you, you stop working the steps and you stop working with a sponsor because you're just like screw it you know and then next thing you know it, it's it's all back to the same i live with my mom and my mom doesn't have a program you know so I'm the one with a program. So if I'm not good with my program, then all hell is, you know. So not working is definitely a barrier to my uh, recovering. Awesome. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. And thank yeah. you for being honest and vulnerable in your opinion. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's the only way to be. With, Ash with Ashley? 
So I try to challenge myself on a weekly basis to name new things that bring me joy that I have not tried, like things that I think might bring me joy. I try three new things every week and I'd add them into my self care like regimen. If I find mm -hmm. something I really like, I go on the list. And What's something that stuck? Blowing bubbles for my dog. <laughs> <laughs> it brings me so much joy. <laughs> Seeing him chasing and, and your dog he's, too. <laughs> yes, he's like bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Look at him. He loves it. Who else? We have a little time here. There is another thing that I want to mention. Um, have you guys heard of, oh, shoot, I don't want to call it the wrong, the Phoenix? It's it? like a, it's like a recovery fitness group. Yes. yes. Yeah. We have one in Augusta and I've been a few times and it's really cool. Um, it's just, it's open to not just people with substance use um issues but also you know mental health and allies and really open to anyone but it's just a place where people can get together and just promotes like healthy healthy activities and um they do exercise it's like a free workout class that we have in augusta called fit but it's under this umbrella of the phoenix i don't really know a whole lot about it but i know it's pretty popular here mm, in augusta awesome. it's pretty cool Thank you. And I meant to mention the Athens Recovery Warriors. Uh, anybody who's in Athens, I know that they meet. Uh, my colleague Haley became one of those. And the the weightlifting and everything she did uh, changed her recovery. She uh, Till she moved, she bought a house and moved. And so she's not able to do that as much. But That's she, like a, a huge part of my recovery, too. And I don't really necessarily do it with that fit group. I go to a gym that's, you know just for regular old people. There are a lot of people in recovery that go there, but it's for yeah, everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a CrossFit gym, but man, that has just helped my mental health and helped with my just staying in recovery so much. Awesome. So yeah, I really consider that a, an important pathway for recovery. Thank you, Brittany. Mm -hmm. uh, Doreen. Hi, I just wanted to echo off of what she said. Um, when we moved over here in Tucker, there's a, I don't know if it's called Phoenix, but there's a fit place that caters to people in recovery. And with the Georgia Council, we haven't talked about it in a while since we came back from COVID, but before COVID, our, our ex executive director on Wednesdays gave us the hour where we could go over there and exercise and do, it's like, um, like a CrossFit, it does like six or seven different exercise in an hour. And we used to actually leave on Wednesdays and go over there oh, wow. and exercise and come back. And that was kind of a part of our wellness for our wellness thing here for the office and um the lake. So I just want to chime in on the lake and water and anything dealing with the ocean. For me, that's a pathway for me. And so I make sure that I do um self-care and going to the ocean. I can't get to the ocean. I go to the little lake off of McAfee and Second Avenue here. And actually where we work in Tucker, it's called North Lake Drive. And there's a lake in the back of the parking lot. A lot of people don't know it's right over there in walking distance across from the post office. But uh, where we go get the mail. But I walk over there sometimes when I go to the mail or I'll drive over there and I'll have my prayer time right in the parking lot by the lake because that moves me from my pathway. You mean there's a lake at North Lake? I didn't know yes, that. Yes, there <laughs> is. I will walk when you go yeah. out and walk. I was going to tell you about that. There is a lake <laughs> over in the corner. There is. Our in back of the defects. In back yeah. of the defects building. Yeah. All right. yeah, well, well, mm -hmm. yeah, recovery is about mental, spiritual, and physical. So you know, a lot. I know for me, I've just started taking care, better care of my physical. You know, like exercise and eating healthier, you know, because it is a threefold, you know, thing. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Manya. And Denise, your hand is up. You'll be the last one because it's 630, right? Okay. So, um, as far as... 
Hang on. Okay, Denise. Okay, so um, as far as my job, so I work as a forensic peer mentor at the um, Transitioning Center for Women. And most of the people on my team, they actually work in the prison. Mm -hmm. So um, what we do um, every other week is we have a team meeting to where we discuss our wellness. We discuss how we feel or what have we been experiencing um, you know, throughout the last two weeks. And then once a year, we have a one week um, uh, conference to where it's basically just self care for the whole team. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it does wonders for us. It, it's really awesome. It just brings some awareness to uh, wellness is a great Yes. Thing, you know, that, I think that's what I did here. I just brought some awareness to all of these pathways. Yes, uh, we know about some of them. There are some of them are right on the top of our minds, and some of us we haven't heard about for years. Some of few nobody's ever heard of, but it's really good just to talk about. Yes, it's been awesome. Thank you. Well, everybody, it's six thirty. I need to let six thirty one. I need to let y'all get on with your life. Thank you. So much. <laughs> we appreciate you, Alvin. Thank you for being here. This was so much yes, fun. Yes, we do. Yes, it was. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. You will be getting your certificates hopefully by the end of the week. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just